Awesome, awesome. How's everyone doing this morning? Feeling good? Feeling good about 2024? Your spirit's up, you're prayed up, 21 days of fasting is going awesome. We started 21 days of prayer and fasting on Monday this week, and Pastor Kevin kicked off Draw Near 21 days of prayer and fasting just last Sunday. And I don't know about you, but I'm really, really excited about this sermon series. And uh, if you weren't here last week and you missed the message, go back, make sure that you watch Pastor Kevin's message. There is so many practical tips that you can glean from his message and apply to your 21 days of prayer and fasting. So go back and do that. It is totally worth it. Um, We also have a ton of curated resources for you. So if you haven't done this already, make sure you go to elmerfullgospel.com. That's elmerfullgospel.com slash 21 days, okay? Just slash 21 days. I'm, I'm saying it twice because I know some of you, you just didn't catch it. Make sure you go there. We have put together in partnership with Church of the Highlands a completely free prayer booklet, okay? And it goes into detail on how to pray, all the different types of models of prayer, and you can just access, access that on your phone and scroll through as you're praying it's awesome. I've gone through the whole booklet myself. We have 21 days of prayer topics on there, so that's going to help you guide your prayers for each and every day. Today, the prayer is to teach us to pray reverently, uh, which is completely fitting for the message that we're going to talk about. But it's not just about prayer. It's also about fasting, so we have resources on there about how to fast and the different types of fasts that you can do. And so if you're not familiar with fasting at all, and you're saying, uh, I don't know what you're talking about, then um, really fasting is stopping from doing something in order to draw near to God. And usually this could be food, you could, you know, maybe skip a meal, you could maybe not eat certain types of food, like donuts, you know, maybe you give up donuts for 21 days, and you know, we, you eat one of those every day, I don't know, maybe it's what you like. Um, or you're like me, and you do a soul fast. And uh, a soul fast is when you fast from social media, and you fast from entertainment. Okay, so there's different types of fasts. And I know some of you are thinking, well, I fast every night from midnight all the way to seven. Uh, that doesn't count. Okay, that's called sleeping, not fasting. All right, so um, we want to give something up in order to draw near to God. And so we are doing this because that's exactly what we want to do. We want what God wants for us as a church, for our families, for our communities. All over this place, we want what God wants for us in 2024. Anybody in this room believe that God has some incredible things for us? You believe it? Let's try that one more time. Do you believe God has some incredible things for you this year? All right, all right, all right. It's always better the second time, so we got to do that sometimes. But the Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And I have a story for you this morning. Um, it has a point, okay? You're going to be thinking, how does this have anything to do with this topic? It has a point. All right. Who here loves cupcakes? Anybody love cupcakes in the room? I know some of you are fast in food, and you're like, man, why are you talking about cupcakes? So when Natalia and I were young, we're still young, but when we were even younger, and we were just married, we were living in Ottawa, and uh, it was late at night, and we had this cupcake like desire, okay? We were just like, we've got to eat some cupcakes. I don't know if you've ever had that moment. It's just like, sugar, please, I need it now. The thing is, it was about 10 p.m. and all of the stores were closed, okay? And so we looked at each other. We had never made cupcakes before, but we're like, really, how hard can it be to make some cupcakes? Can't be that hard, right? Right? No, not that hard. And so we, we get into the instructions and we're, we're recipes, I guess, is the word for it. And we start making the recipe and, and uh, we're thinking, you know, we want to do a few batches. And so we do uh, an extra amount of our recipe. And, and so we're kind of going through it. And then we realize, uh-oh, uh, we need a mixer. But the thing is, I didn't have a mixer. So I thought, well, I'll just use a spatula because, you know, just sheer willpower will make this happen. I can just use a spatula, right? And so I get in there, I'm like using this spatula, mixing this thing, and I'm mixing it, and I'm going faster and faster and faster, and nothing's happening. Just, just nothing. I'm like, why is this, what's going on? And so I keep going at it, half an hour in, still nothing has happened. 
And so I asked Natalia to come over and check her. And I just asked her, I'm like, can you please check on this recipe again? And so she looks over and she smiles at me and she's like, Nathan, this isn't for cupcakes. This is for icing. (laughs) And so at that point, I was already like completely defeated. Everything did not go as planned. And so we put like this massive bowl of icing into the fridge. (laughs) And we had cupcakes the next day. But sometimes that's how life goes, right? Sometimes life, you start things, and you're really excited about it, and you think it's going to go great, but then things start to change, and you lose momentum, and it just doesn't go to plan, and that's exactly like our prayer life. A lot of us, we, 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 we are inspired to start prayer, right? We, we hear about 21 days of prayer and fast, and we're like, yes, I'm all in. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast, and you get like three days in, and you're like, Mm, I don't know about that fasting thing. I really want my donuts today. And so you're like, ah, I don't know. I don't know. Or you start praying, and, and you really want God to, to do something in your life, and, and, and you just don't see it happen. And so you're like, you know, you just start to lose momentum. And the thing is, a lot of us have inspiration, but we're lacking in information. And that's the same way with our prayer life. We're inspired to start, but we don't have the right information to continue. We're using a spatula instead of a mixer. We don't have the right tools. And so today, when I want to, basically what I want to do is I want to dive in to this uh, model of prayer. It's called the tabernacle prayer. And so maybe you've been on this journey and you're like, you know, I just, prayer has not been working for me. Prayer is just, I'm just not getting the answers that I really want. Or maybe you, you just don't really know how to pray. You, you start praying, but you just, there's not a lot of depth to your prayer life. And so if that's you today, I want to teach you how to pray. And so we're going to turn first in our Bibles to Ephesians six eighteen, And we're going to look at what Paul says here. He says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And so what he's saying here is, I want you to pray the way that God wants you to pray. And so I want to teach you a kind of prayer. I want to teach you a biblical model that you can follow through in your life and pray through on these next 21 days and throughout the rest of the year. And the thing is, it's really good that we have biblical models. And I'll tell you why. Because for many of us, we were taught to do simple memorizations or to recite prayers, and that's all fine and good. But really, when, when we start to think about the model or the memorization of certain prayers, like start thinking about this one. Maybe, maybe you grew up with this one. Now I lay me down to sleep I pray the Lord my soul to keep, if I should die before I wake. We're like, hey, little guy, (laughs) have a good sleep tonight. See you in the morning, maybe, if you don't die, right? And so sometimes we gotta, we gotta think about what are we really saying? And so it's good to have biblical models because these models set us up for ways to connect with God that's not just a memorization. And God never really intended for prayer to just be memorization. He intended it to be this ongoing conversation where we actually spend time and make time for him. And so today we are looking at this transformative model called the tabernacle prayer. And this prayer will help you if you have never gone through the tabernacle prayer. It is going to help revolutionize the way that you connect with God. Okay? Don't take those words lightly. I mean it. And so if you're not the type of person to take notes, I want you to pull out your notepad that you didn't bring with you this morning um, and pull out that pencil that you don't have on hand and start taking notes, right? I got you. Just grab your phone, okay? If you have a phone, it's okay. Just don't search on social media because you're fasting for that likely as well. And just start taking some notes in your note, your note app, okay? Um, so this is going to be good, but I want to start off with some context. The Jewish people they were enslaved, right? They were in Egypt, and then Moses frees them, and then they cross the Red Sea, 
and then they receive the Ten Commandments, right? And then they are making their way to the Promised Land. What would have and should have taken a couple of weeks ends up turning into a 40-year journey. Why did that happen? Because they disobeyed God. But here's the unique thing about God. He still wants to connect with us even when we're disobedient to him. That's pretty awesome. And so this is where the tabernacle enters into the picture. You can kind of think of the tabernacle like a portable church. The tabernacle was set up and it was teared down. Whenever God moved, they moved. Whenever God stayed, they stayed. It was a portable church. And eventually it became the uh, church, uh, the, sorry, the temple in Jerusalem, uh, which was a permanent church like this one. But before that, it was portable. And so let's take a look at what it says in Exodus 25, 8. It says, then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. God wants to dwell among us. Even in all of our complications, even in all of our difficulties, even in all of that, God wants to dwell with us. And so I don't know if you know this or not, but the word tabernacle means to dwell with. And Jesus actually said this in John 1, 14, that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And so I want to show you a picture here of what the tabernacle would look like. We'll put it up this, on the screen. Um, hopefully you can see that. But the tabernacle would look something like this. And so you can see it's a very portable setup. There's the gates at the front, the outer court. And then you'll see all this different type of furniture, which we're going to go through today. And then you would get back to that big tent. And there was two sections. There was the first section that had a little bit more furniture in it. And then there was a veil. Okay? And then you would walk through that veil and you would meet with God. And so in order to get to that place, in order to get to the presence of God... It involved seven steps, okay? And so we have to remember this is the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus tore the veil, right? So we know that today we can go directly to Jesus. We don't have to do all these physical steps, right? Um, but there's something beautiful about the process of the Old. So just because Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament doesn't mean that the Old Testament is no longer useful. There's so many things in the Old Testament that we can still use, that still apply, that still work, that are still powerful and amazing for us to implement in the new, okay? And so we're going to dive into this thing. And one of the, thing, one of the things that I want to point out about this, too, is something really incredible in Exodus 33, 11. Listen to what this says. This is how God connects, or sorry, how Moses connects to God in the Old Testament. It says, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. That was Old Testament. Isn't that pretty incredible? God wants to speak to you as a friend. I don't know if you're catching that or not. God wants to speak to you as a friend, even though he's all-powerful, even though he's all-knowing, even though he's ever-present, he still wants to speak to you as a friend. And that's Old Testament. So there's some good things that we can take from the old and apply to the new. And so God wants to speak to you today. And I believe that if you really met God in this kind of way, that your life would be radically changed. You wouldn't be sitting there saying, prayer, oh, I don't want to pray, right? Oh, that's so, oh, no, nah, nah. We would be so engaged with God that we would want prayer to be an active part of our life. And so, yes, Jesus tears the veil, and you can have direct access to God, but there's something beautiful about honoring the principle of the process, okay? And this is what God used to connect with his people in the Old Testament. All right. So, let's dive in. Seven different steps that they took to enter the presence of of God. And each of these steps represent things that you can pray through as you connect with him. So the first step is the outer courts. 
So the outer courts there, you can see there's a gate and the outer courts. Um, and so before you ever encountered any piece of furniture, you would come to this outer court and you would walk through the gates. And there's a biblical reference about this in Psalms 100 verse 4. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So before anything else, before we do anything, we first start with praise. We first start with thanksgiving. And so we need to be reminded of this because sometimes what we do is we go to God with our wish list, right? The only time that we seem to go to God is when we need something from him. And so we go to him and say, hey, can you do this, 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 peace, right? And so we kind of treat him like a little bit of a genie, and we never thank him either. It's like, hey, you're the genie that's here for me, and uh, you just need to do this. But that's not how prayer is meant to be. And so this idea of, of entering into his courts with praise is actually one of the reasons why we start off our services with praise. We say the song today, praise, right? It's all about praise, because we want to enter into his courts with praise. So if you're ever wondering, why do we start off our, our, our worship services with praise type songs? It's biblical. We're not trying to lead you astray here. And so we need to start praying things like, God, thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for the faithfulness that you ha have continued to do over the course of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for blessing me. Thank you for allowing me to have a, a roof over my head and clothes on my back. Thank you that I have food on my table. Thank you for doing the basic things in my life. Thank you for what you do. And so before we ever enter into our prayer, this is practical for you today, I encourage you to take time to sing along with a song of praise. Throw it on Spotify, whatever it is. Take time to praise. Take, take time to thank God before you dive into the needs or the requests that you have of him. Okay? So let's do that. The second step is the brazen altar. And I have an image of that. The brazen altar. Now this thing, if you do not like blood, I would recommend you don't go back and try to watch videos from the Old Testament. Um, they don't exist. I'm just, it's just a joke, okay? Um, but this thing was bloody. It was bloody, bloody, bloody. Animal carcasses, terrible smells of burning animals. It was bad, all right? And what this thing did with all of that nastiness and all of that blood, it was a reminder to the people that something had to be sacrificed. Something had to give up its blood for the sins of the people. And so this is where the priest would sacrifice animals for the sins of the people, and there would be all of this nastiness happening. But the amazing thing is, is we don't have to continue sacrificing animals to this day. It doesn't have to happen anymore because there's someone called Jesus who was the perfect spotless lamb and he was sacrificed on our behalf. And so Jesus paid all of our sins on the cross once and for all. And so thank God. Well, I, I was going to say something, but I'm going to hold off on it just in case someone really likes lamb chops. Okay. Um, all right, so you have to pause at the brazen altar. When you go into prayer, you're going to start with praise, you're going to start with thanks, and then you're going to lean into taking time to think about what Jesus has done for you on the cross. You're going to take some time and think about the blood that he shed for you, and you're going to say, thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. And the thing is, there are people today that would like to shy away from the blood. There are people today that don't want to talk about the blood because it is messy, because it can be nasty. But I'm not one of those people. 
I believe that we should continue talking about the blood. I believe that we should continue singing about it, continue teaching about it, because the thing is, the blood of Jesus is the only reason you can ever take a next step towards God. Without the blood of Jesus, there is not that connection. Without the blood of Jesus, there is no forgiveness of sins, and so the blood is very important. And so if you are a Christian, I encourage you, Do not step away and shy away from the conversation about the blood. Psalms 103. These are some benefits that we see in Scripture from the blood, the shed blood of Jesus. It says, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, that your youth is renewed like eagles. Those are some benefits. What's incredible about this is the psalmist who's talking about this. This is prophetic. And so it's amazing that we receive these benefits. And so if you're taking notes, there are five benefits from this. Salvation, healing, redemption, transformation, and blessing. All because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Not just our sins, but benefits. And so we take time to praise And we take time to thank him for his sacrifice. The third step is the laver. We have an image of that. The laver. This was like a big basin or a big bowl of water. um, And people would use this to wash. And the thing is, I don't know if you can tell from that picture, but across the laver were these mirrors. And so as people were washing, they would see themselves and they would come to the recognition that I'm not perfect. I still need to be cleansed. I still need that cleansing in my life. God, wash me clean. And so in this step, when you're praying through this step, you want to say, God, I give you every single part of me. I'm not going to hold anything back. And you can even go as far to say, God, I give you my body as a sacrifice. And so what does that look like? That kind of sounds strange, right? Start with your mind. I give you my mind. I give you my thoughts. I want my mind to be pure. I got to give you my ears. I want to be sensitive to what you're saying to me. I got to give you my eyes. I make a covenant not to look lustfully at anyone else. I got to give you my mouth. I, I, I want to be someone who builds someone's up rather than tear them down. God, I give you my hands. I want to live open-handedly. I want to live generously. I want to do things for others. God, I give you my feet. I will follow you anywhere that you lead me to go. I will go if you say go. And so this is the labor. We wash ourselves and say, God, you take every part of me. Cleanse me and renew me. Romans 12, 1 says it this way. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your, can you say this with me? This is your true and proper worship. And so offering yourself to God is your proper worship. At the end of the day, it's not about how well you can sing. It's not about if you're totally on key or not. But it's about offering yourself as a living sacrifice. Another scripture reference we can look at for this portion of the prayer is Psalms 139, 23 to 24. You can do this daily. It says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And so we need to be daily taking time to ask God, is there anything that I'm missing in my life right now? Is there any sin in my life that I just can't see? 
And it's in these moments that God will often remind you about something that maybe you weren't thinking about. And so that's the labor. It's about being washed clean and examining ourselves. Let's continue on. Step four. So at this point, you would enter into this little tent, and the first thing that you would see is a seven-pronged candlestick, okay, or a Jewish menorah, all right? So the candlestick had this fire that would burn in it continually, and it would never go out. And so in the Old Testament and the New Testament, what we know about the burning fire, the candlestick, it represented the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit. And so at this moment, at this part of the tabernacle pray, prayer, you can say, Holy Spirit, I invite you to work in my life. And one of the ways you can do that is by going through the fruit of the Spirit, found in Galatians 5, to 23. Some of you will know this really well. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. In other translations, you'll see that it says patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. And so what you want to know when it comes to this is start to just ask the Holy Spirit, what is it that I'm missing from this list? What is it that I need more of in my life? And I guarantee the Holy Spirit will make you aware of what you need. What are you missing and where you can grow? Right? I think it'd be really nice if all of us had a little bit more kindness in our lives. I think it'd be really nice if all of us had a little bit more peace in our life and gentleness in our life. And the truth is, if we're Christians who are connected with God and we are connected with the Holy Spirit and we're allowing him to lead us where he wants us to go, we're going to have these overflowing within us. People are going to look at you and say, hey, that person is so kind. That person's so loving and, and caring and, and gentle, and I've never seen someone with so much self-control. It's because you've surrendered your life and said, Holy Spirit, lead where you want me to go and make me who you want me to be, okay? So that's the fourth step. The fifth step is the table of showbread. The table of showbread. And so on the other side of this little room was 12 freshly baked loaves that were put on this table of showbread. And Natalia and I, when we were on our holidays, we went to Upper Canada Village. And if you've ever been to Upper Canada, Upper Canada Village, you'll know there's a bakery there. And it's an old school bakery. And we were just so happy. My, my wife loves, well, she loves baked goods in baked goods in general, but she really loves bread. And so we went into this bakery, and they had all of this fresh bread laid out across the table, and it smelt amazing, like divine. Like, we were so hungry, too. We hadn't eaten. We were like, can we just have a piece of that bread? Unfortunately, you're not allowed to eat in the bakery. They take it, and they put it in the store. But that's exactly what happens here. That smell of the bread was to draw your attention in and make you hungry for God. And so the table represents the word of God. It represents how we need to feed on the scriptures. There's an example of this when Jesus was fasting. Okay, by the way, I know I'm talking about a lot of food things today, so if you're fasting, I'm sorry, but you can make it through 14 more days to go. Okay, you got this. Matthew 4.4, 4, it says, Jesus answered, it is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we don't just live on physical bread, but we live on the word of God. We live on the Bible. And so if you're fasting and you're feeling tempted about those donuts or about some bread with some butter, start to speak some scripture over your life because scripture can sustain you the same way it sustained Jesus, okay? So it's important to read the scripture. It's important to feed on the word of God. We need to start declaring the scriptures over our families, 
We need to start declaring the scriptures over our church family. We need to start declaring the scripture over our community because there is power in the word of God. And so as you begin to pray, pull out your Bible app, pull out your Bible, your physical one with pages, if you still remember what that is, and start praying these scriptures. Don't just read. I mean, you can read it when you pray, but start praying the scriptures. My wife is so good at this. She will pray the scriptures. She's got a great mind. She's memorized so many things, and she saw, she, she'll just be like, you know, I don't know what to pray, but I feel this scripture needs to be prayed over this person. That's the kind of place that we want to get to, okay? So pray the scriptures. Dive into your Bible. You can quote it, claim it, pray it. All right. Then finally, step six. Before you go to meet with God, there was this little altar, and this little altar was burning incense 24-7. It's called the altar of incense. Now, this wasn't a disgusting smell, right, like the brazen one. This was actually a smell that was nice. It had Bath and Body Works vibes. Anyone go in there over the holidays? <laughs> smells so good. So the smell of the incense would actually cover up the smell of the blood of the sacrificed animals. And what we see in the, in the scripture is that incense was always something that we gave to God. It was always something that was on our behalf to him. And so we want to be a sweet-smelling incense to God. 2 Corinthians 2.15, I'm just going to say the first part of it here, but it says, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ. And so what is this sweet-smelling incense? What is this pleasing aroma? Worship. It's worship. And so you might be thinking, well, wait a sec. We already talked about worship. Don't we enter into the gates, and, and don't we enter into the outer courts with worship? Well, worship is a little different than praise, because we were talking about praise. And so when it comes to worship, Worship is actually about magnifying our creator. It's about magnifying God. Whereas praise is about thanking him for all that he has done. And so the best way that you can worship God is actually by telling him who he is. Declaring who he is. If you really want to magnify anyone else in this world, declare who they are. Start telling them about who they are. My wife is my best friend. She's gorgeous, beautiful, intelligent. She is the mother of my children. She is the financer of our home. Did I mention she's beautiful? She is incredible, and I love her immensely. When you go to pray, do you just say, God I need this. No. You go to him and say, God, you are my provider. You are my peace. You are my joy. You are my counselor. You are my Lord. You are my savior. You are my everything. You are my wonderful. You are beginning and end. You are now and you are eternal you have done everything that is who you are that is what worship is when we begin to magnify him and so if it feels good when you say it to your spouse you better believe it also feels good when we say it to god and so in this part we focus in on who we're about to talk to and we prepare our hearts for the big moment and once you've completed all of these steps your heart just is completely open to entertain the presence of God and to hear what God wants to say to you in that moment. And so this leads us to the seventh and final step, which is the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Old Testament, they would come to the curtain and they would have to part this curtain. And the next thing that they would see is God. They would see God. 
The Ark of the Covenant was where the presence of God would reside, and the priest would go in and speak to God on behalf of the people. They would intercede for them. And so let me ask you this. If you ever come before God, having completed all of these steps, and you meet with him, what do you say to him? What do you say? You begin to intercede for everyone around you. You begin to intercede for your family. You begin to intercede for your friends. You begin to intercede for your church family. You begin to intercede for your pastors. You begin to intercede for your government officials. You begin to intercede on behalf of everyone. And we need to take a posture, church, that doesn't make prayer all about us, but it makes it about everyone else. We need to have this attitude that says, Jesus, you can do anything in anybody's life. And so we need to pray, God, break this stronghold that we sense in our community. Break the gates wide open. Lord, break the, 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 the issues that you're facing in your marriage. God, break those issues. Watch my kids and the kids that used to go to church who are away from the church. Let them come back. Right? We need to start praying things like, God, we need breakthrough. We need breakthrough. So you begin to intercede on behalf of those around you. You intercede for people. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2 says, I urge then first of all that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peacefully and quiet lives in all good godliness and holiness. And so that's the tabernacle prayer. We could have made that four weeks, <laughs> probably seven weeks actually. We could have done each one. That was a quick version of the tabernacle prayer. But here, I got a picture up here. It's got all of the steps, okay? And I want to just go through them one more time. If you're taking notes and you miss a point, this is what it is. First, we praise him. Second, we thank him for his sacrifice. Third, we give our lives to him fully. Fourth, we ask the Holy Spirit to lead us. Fifth, we pray the word of God. Sixth, we worship him. And seven, we intercede on behalf of of others. So as I close this morning, I want to let you know this. This is a model that can revolutionize your prayer life. This is something that is biblical, and it is powerful, and it can prepare your heart and your mind to talk with your friend, to talk with God. The promise of scripture is that if you draw near to God, then he will draw near to you. And so my challenge to you over this next week is to take the time to pray this prayer. Take the time, go on our website, almerfulgospel.com slash 21 days. Download the prayer book. You can read it on your desktop, read it on your phone. If you have a lot of printer pages at home, you can print it off. I think it's like 70 something pages. So that's up to you. But do that and go through this model. Try it out for one day. There's literal prayers in that booklet that you can pray. Okay? So that's my challenge to you today. Spend some time, and I believe that you will sense God in a far greater way than you have been. Okay? Let's stand this morning. If you will, all eyes closed in this room. If you're at that place right now and you're saying, you know, I want that kind of prayer life. I want that kind of power in my life. I want to see God move like, like he hasn't moved in my life before. Or I want to see God move in ways that he used to in my life. If that's you, can you just raise up your hand real quick for me? Yeah. I want God to move in my life too. And so I want to pray for you this morning, and then I want to pray for another group of people. But Heavenly Father, we, we are so appreciative of what you have done for us. 
we praise you and we give you thanks for the work that you've done on the cross. And Lord, thank you for all of these different models that we see in prayer. But God, you saw every hand that was raised and you know exactly where they are in this place. You know what's on their heart. You know what they want to see happen in their lives. And so Lord, I just pray that you would do something incredible in their life. Lord, I pray that you would intervene. You would give us the strength to, to lean into this spiritual discipline. But God, more than that, I pray that they would see accomplished what they want to see accomplished according to your will. God, that maybe it's their family, that their family would be mended. It's a relationship that's broken. God, bring that relationship back together. Maybe it's forgiveness that they, they need to have in their hearts. Maybe it's a child and, and it's an issue that they're going through in their life. Whatever it is, Lord, we just submit that to you. And Lord, I pray that their lives would be overflowing with prayer and that they would see the power that comes with evoking and declaring your name over that. In Jesus' name.